Shane was going to be a veterinarian. It's all he had ever wanted to be, his whole life. Well, I mean, except for, of course, you know, a ninja for a while and, uh, you know, a clown for a while, but this was it. He'd made up his mind. He was working really hard at school to get good grades and <laughs> Tony was researching scholarships. But for now, Shane had a job at the uh, animal shelter where he'd volunteered as a kid and uh, he was learning a lot from the director and from the vet and from the volunteers. His favorite volunteers were Artie and Eloise. They were self-described hippies and had been for like oh, 50 years or something. And they had matching long silver braids and matching heart tattoos on their left hands. They looked after adoptions. The days were quite busy, but uh, they were very patient and they were great with people and they were warm and loving and absolutely impossible with paperwork. <laughs> this one time, Artie had actually filled in a form upside down. Can you do that by mistake? Who knows? Artie could, apparently. But they were, they were great people and they could tell on sight a cat person from a dog person. And they just had an instinct for making those introductions. There was one other unofficial member of staff named Hafa. Hafa had been abandoned six years ago and uh, just never adopted, so she stayed on. Hafa had not been cute as a pup and she was not pretty as an adult. She might have been a cross between Poodle and Mastiff, or maybe Poodle and Newfie. She had a squashed face and jowls. She was mostly curly, curly black hair with these odd patches of brown. Her hind legs were longer than her front legs. And, oh, did she snore. And she was huge. Her shoulder was nearly waist high on Shane. Half a horse, some people joked. But she was, she was gentle and she was helpful. Shane loved to take her walking the other dogs because uh, she'd, he'd hand her the leash and she'd trot the other dog down the, down the track and back again and of course by the time they got back, the leash was completely soaked in drool, but Shane just thought it was totally worth it. Hafa would drag the big sacks of food down the kennel hallway. She'd trot around after the kittens and bat the ball for them to chase, or she'd lie down and let them crawl all over her through her thick curly mat. She drew the line at litter boxes. But any animal who came in hurt was hers, like Pico. Pico had been brought in late on a Thursday afternoon by a cop. She was wrapped in a blanket. She'd been starved. She was dehydrated. She was bruised. She had a broken leg and one eye swollen shut. When the vet unwrapped her on the table, Shane was taken by surprise at how angry it made him. His hands actually started to shake. How could somebody, how can you do this? Dr. Lozano looked at him and said, are you okay? He just said, yeah, yeah, it, I just, she said, I know so we make her better, right? He took a deep breath and said, right. So they worked while Hafa hovered. They set the broken bone, they started rehydrating the little body, and they treated the eye, and they tucked her gently into one of the cubbies and latched the door and left her in the, reco in the recovery room. 
Hatha laid down in front of the cubby like she was a lion protecting her cub. Shane washed up and went out to the lobby. Meg was waiting and had been for a little while, so he apologized and she just gave him a hug because Eloise had explained. Shane was again in again on Saturday afternoon and the first thing he did was check on Pico. And there was Hafa, either still or again, on guard, keeping watch. Pico looked to her when Shane opened the cubby door and half a snuffled. He's okay, don't worry about it. But the pup still trembled a bit while he checked her cast and her bandages. So he sat down and he stroked her little head until she stopped shaking and went back to sleep. He told Hafa, come on you, stretch your legs. She's okay for now. Come help me feed everybody. So she stood up and snuffled at Pico through the door and then she followed him out and into the kennel. The rest of the day was dogs to walk and visitors to serve, though that was mostly Artie and Eloise. Just before closing, things had quieted down and uh, the two of them were in the break room and Shane and Hafa were tidying up the kennels. The beeper sounded in the lobby. Someone had come in. Shane said to Hafa, I'll be right back, you wait. She snuffled. He went past the break room and said, uh, I got it. Artie was giving El Eloise a foot massage and uh, she said, thanks Starshine. The man in the lobby was angry. He took one look at Shane and he just said, who's in charge? Shane said, well, the director's not here right now, but maybe I can help you. The man sneered and barged up to Shane and poked him in the chest with his finger. He said, you want to help me? Fine, you can help me get my property back. Shane took a step back and he said, um, yeah, I, I don't think so, sir, but if you come back on Monday, I'm not waiting until Monday. I want it now. You got my dog? I want it back. Artie's voice behind Shane said, Hey man, be cool. Dogs aren't property. I paid for it. It's mine. The cops took it and I want it back. Shane stepped to the inner doorway to block it. He kept his voice from shaking long enough to say, Sir, if you don't leave now, we're going to call the police. Artie went to the desk and started to dial. The man grabbed Shane by the front of his shirt and yanked it and tripped him so that he fell away from the door and landed hard on his knees. The man went through to the kennel. Artie had already dialed. Don't be a hero, Starshine. Wait for the cops. Shane hesitated just for a minute and then ran through. The man was in the kettle, storming up and down, looking in every cage and banging on the doors. He reached the end and he turned around. He came back at Shane and shoved him again. Shane grabbed his sleeve and the man swung at him. Shane ducked and the hit just caught the back of his head. The man was off again. The police are coming. Stop this. The man ignored him. He'd found the recovery room. All the cubbies were empty except for one. The one that Hatha was lying in front of. The man said, what is that ugly thing? And he laughed. He said, move ugly mutt or I'll move you. Hatha looked up at him and snuffled. The man picked up a chair and moved closer. I said, move mutt. Hatha kept her eyes on his while she thought about it. She looked at the chair and then she slowly stood up. She lowered her head. She bared her teeth. 
and for the first time in her gentle, loving life, she growled. It was a growl that sounded like it came from somewhere underground. It was deep. It was solid. It was a primal sound that just said, no. The man froze for a second and then took half a step forward. Half a matched him, growling louder now. The man froze again. He held the chair a little closer to himself. Yeah, nice dog. Good dog. Sit down. He took half a step back and so did half a. They stayed locked like that forever. Hafa snarling and the man with his chair until finally Hafa's ears twitched and she stopped growling and they heard sirens. And Shane whispered, thank you, God. Days later, Shane sat in Walt's kitchen and, and told him the whole story again, how, as much as anything, how unsettling it was to see Hafa like that, threatening, untamed. He said, I've never been afraid of her before, but for a minute she was, she was someone else. She's always been so gentle. Walt nodded and said, yeah, it's easy to mistake gentle for harmless. But Hafa knows the difference. Somebody sees her toddling around up to her knees in kittens, they might think she's soft, but she knows what she's capable of and she uses it for others, not against them. She's strong, but she knows when to be gentle, and when to take a stand. We need people like that, don't we, girl? And he reached down beside him and he petted Pico, who was curled up in her new favorite place by his feet. Shane smiled and asked, how's she doing? Walt said, we are doing very nicely. Thank you for asking.